Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, July 17th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight. As details of the investigation uh, proceed, uh, we'll make sure that uh, the FBI, as well as local law enforcement, uh, are providing uh, the public with all the information. In the wake of another gun-free zone murder, politicians are hesitant to push their usual gun control agenda. Then, nukes and Iran, and what the Greece crisis means for the world at large. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We know that uh, what appears to be a lone gunman carried out these attacks. Uh, we've identified a name, and at this point, a full investigation is taking place. The FBI will be in the lead, uh, working closely with local law enforcement. Uh, we've also been uh, in contact with uh, the Department of Defense to make sure that uh, all our defense facilities are uh, properly uh, attentive and vigilant uh, as we sort through uh, exactly what happened. Uh, and as details of the investigation uh, proceed, uh, we'll make sure that uh, the FBI, as well as local law enforcement, uh, are providing uh, the public with all the information uh, that's involved. That was Obama's reaction following the shooting in Chattanooga that left four Marines dead and two others injured. Very calm indeed. And of course, that's because he can't exploit this attack for his political agenda. Because that would only serve to highlight the fact that once again, our military was attacked here on U.S. soil. We can trust them with tanks, attack helicopters, and fighter jets, but not a sidearm at their post. And just to, to show you how totally backward this country is, now armed Americans are standing guard outside military recruitment centers. Uh, this is a group led by uh, Hiram resident Crystal Tuello, and this group says that they aim to protect their local recruitment center while honoring the lives of the fallen Marines. Uh, Crystal said, to think the people who are supposed to protect and serve us are unable to protect themselves. It's, that's absurd. Now, under current U.S. law, no firearms are permitted inside of military recruitment centers and similar facilities. Tuello, whose brother is a military recruiter, says that such gun-free zones leave American troops vulnerable to attack. And if and of course, that is something that we're continually saying here, continually pointing out. And you'll notice that that call for gun control was missing from Obama's speech. Uh, also missing was his usual admonishment for the American people that these type of attacks don't happen anywhere else. Uh, and he also didn't use the phrase domestic terrorism, even though the shooter was a, a naturalized American citizen. So he, he pretty much just said, you know, we're gonna wait for all the details to come in. But you'll recall, he didn't need to wait for all the details after the Charleston shooting. He was immediately calling for gun control. But I don't need to be constrained about the emotions that tragedies like this raise. I've had to make statements like this too many times. Communities like this have had to endure tragedies like this too many times. We don't have all the facts, but we do know that, once again, innocent people were killed in part because someone who wanted to inflict harm had no trouble getting their hands on a gun. And the president made it pretty clear how he felt in the aftermath of the killing of four unarmed Marines. Uh, take a look at this tweet that he sent out. This is before he even commented on the terror attack. The White House tweeted out a statement, wishing Muslims happy Ramadan. Eid Mubarak, as Ramadan came to a close, and he adds that the holiday is a reminder to every American of the importance of respecting those of all faiths and beliefs. So it was only after Obama had given this little lecture to the American people about respecting Islam that then he paid tribute to the four dead Marines with that pitiful and unofficial press conference. So completely shameless, and of course, we'll have to wait and see if he's going to spontaneously bust out in amazing grace here in the following days. But um, last I checked, he still hadn't made even one single tweet about this attack. He was careful to point out, however, that the, the attack was 
uh, carried out by a lone gunman here. And Ted Cruz shot back at that by saying there's no such thing as a lone gunman in radical Islam. He said in the wake of this vicious attack on our nation, we need to rid ourselves of two dangerous delusions. First and foremost, that a lone gunman, as President Obama described the shooter, is somehow isolated from the larger threat of radical Islamic terrorism. In the modern world, no one acts in isolation. Through social media, ISIS, Al Qaeda and other groups are infiltrating our nation with impunity, while our government will not even admit that radical Islamic terrorism is a problem. And of course, the second delusion that Cruz went on to talk about in this attack is the fact that Obama thinks that this is somehow isolated from the terror attack that took place in 2009 on military facilities, also involving Islamic extremists in Little Rock, Arkansas and Fort Hood, Texas. Totally delusional, didn't want to bring that up. Again, very calm there in that press conference. Uh, Cruz went on to say the Obama administration was woefully reluctant to call either an act of radical Islamic terrorism, instead suggesting workplace violence as a justification for the killings. But it's not just Obama that's being completely delusional here, pushing their agenda. The media as well as complicit in this. This is the same media that wanted to bl blame all white people, to say all white people need to feel guilty about this Charleston uh, shooting. They're absolutely petrified of talking about Islamic extremism. So obviously nothing has changed. Political correctness is king following this attack on Marines. One CNN analyst asserted that he might not even be a Muslim. Uh, this, uh, he was asked by John Berman what the name Mohammed Youssef Abdulaziz suggested about the nature of the attack. A CNN analyst and former FBI assistant director Tom Fuentes said, I know what the name sounds like, but we don't know that it's a Muslim name. We know it's an Arabic name. We don't know what this individual was believing in, and, and that's, that's what they were going to be trying to determine. Of course, they were able to determine exactly what Dylan Roof's motives were from some pictures on his Facebook page before he had admitted there to the cops. So once again, total hypocrisy. And an MSNBC host, Andrea Mitchell, tried to divert attention from Abdulaziz's own blog. His blog revealed that Islam played a central role in his ideology. And instead, she chose to ask one of his former classmates whether or not he was into guns. Were guns a big part of activity, social or other activity? Did he hunt? Did he shoot? Um, I mean, was that just part of small town Tennessee activity? Um, actually, he wasn't one of the guys that I ever heard about, you know, going hunting or he wasn't really that kind of guy, but he also didn't really tell a lot of people about his personal life. I don't think very many people knew much about him. He just was very reserved and kept to himself. But even though he's really politically incorrect, he is a businessman, so perhaps Trump could be good for the country. Lord knows we really need an economic recovery here. Now, on today's Alex Jones show, Peter Schiff was discussing the possible economic recovery or failure and What's going on in Puerto Rico? Our government facilitated the crisis that is happening in that country right now. So I want to get into that with him till about 40 after. Then I'm going to give the number out and take your calls on the shooting and give you the latest uh, on that front. But Peter Schiff is with Europac.com, and he manages billions successfully. He also is host of the Peter Schiff Show, is a frequent guest on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, you name it, uh, and this transmission. And he ran for the Senate in 2010. He was Ron Paul's chief presidential advisor on economics uh, in his first campaign as well. And he's a, a school, he's a, a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics, which I would just call the theory of economic reality. It's prima facie or on its face. Peter, I, I know you don't really get into politics a lot, but you're a smart guy. I want your take on we can't say we're boys and girls, we're purple penguins. I'm not kidding in public schools because it's hurtful to be a boy or a girl for somebody that doesn't know what they are. And we're going to ban the Confederate flag and blow up Mount Rushmore and, you know, all this political correctness. But no one can criticize radical Islamists that have now uh, uh, had multiple attacks inside the U.S., uh, attacked, you know, blew up a ship yesterday in the Mediterranean, uh, are just running wild, and Obama puts out a bizarre congratulation before he even says anything about the dead Marines, what is going on here in your view? 
Well, you know, it's all about political correctness. It's about form over substance. I mean, we don't want to address the real issues or the real problems. Uh, so we want to talk in sound bites about things that, you know, make us feel good about ourselves or, you know, tug at the heartstrings. And, and so I, I think there's a, a political agenda here at work that's a lot uh, stronger than the need for, uh, you know, national security or anything that would actually help the U.S. economy in the long run. It's mo more about uh, making us feel good in the short run and we can pretend everything is okay. Now, I know you're down in Puerto Rico right now investigating. They're saying it's the next shoe to drop. Do you agree with that? And what's your take as we talked two weeks ago about uh, what's happened since? Uh, you were uh, China's degenerating. Things are getting worse. That's what you were predicting. Others were predicting. Uh, what do you see happening? I don't know if it's a shoot and drop. I think it's a problem, and I think it's a, it's a look into our future because Puerto Rico has borrowed a lot of money. We've encouraged that uh, by enticing all the debt, by making it triple tax-free in the United States. You know, we made it tax-free to invest in the government, but not in the private sector. So what we did with Puerto Rico was we helped them grow the government, not the private sector, and that's to the detriment of Puerto Rico. Meanwhile, we enticed all their residents onto the welfare rolls, we made it very difficult for people to get jobs by subjecting them to a minimum wage that is effectively double what it is in the U.S. mainland. So we've wiped out entry-level jobs. Only 40 percent of the population is employed. Wow. Uh, the rest live on welfare. So, you know, we've, we've hurt this economy tremendously with all these liberal po you know, um, uh, programs that are being prescribed for the United States. And look at how sick that medicine made Puerto Rico. Why would we want to do it here? It's crazy. Where do you see all this going? What's your take on the China situation? A lot of predictions by smart people that this winter is going to be hellish on markets, uh, bond markets, you name it. I mean, uh, give us your analysis of that. Well, I'm, most people are optimistic, I think, on the market, certainly the U.S. market. I don't, I don't share that. I, I don't think the market's going to collapse, though, because I don't think the Federal Reserve will allow it to collapse. I don't believe that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates like everybody thinks. In fact, if you look at the testimony of Janet Yellen this week, she testified up on Capitol Hill, all the headlines were about how she's about to raise rates, how she reaffirms that the Fed's going to raise rates this year. That helped the dollar. That sent gold to a new low for the year. But if you actually look at what she said, she didn't say she was going to raise rates. All she said was that if the economy evolves the way they expect, which is a big if, because it never evolves the way they expect. They've been fact, saying that for two years. If it gets better, they're going to raise them. Yeah, but they didn't even say they're going to raise them. All she said is, if the economy evolves as they expect, it may be appropriate to raise rates. Not that it will be appropriate, but that it might be. And even if it is appropriate to raise them, that doesn't mean the Fed will raise them. I mean, the Fed could say, well, it's appropriate, but we're not going to do it because we don't want to. I mean, it's been appropriate to raise rates for years and they haven't done it. In fact, it wasn't appropriate to lower them to zero. This is not about propriety. This is about expedience. And I think the Fed will keep interest rates at zero regardless of what's appropriate. Now, I always ask the questions when you come on, but, but, but what's on your radar screen uh, economically? What's Peter Schiff looking at right now, both positive and negative? Look, I just look in, in amazement at how many people can be fooled by this gigantic bubble. And, it, and it's almost as if the bigger the bubble, the fewer people can see it. Because in my mind, this is worse than the bubble that led to the financial crisis of 2008. It's certainly worse than the bubble that led to this dot-com debacle in 2000, 2001. Yet everybody is so sanguine. Everybody thinks the US economy is in great shape. They think Janet Yellen did a great job, just like they thought Alan Greenspan did a great job. He did a disastrous job. We lived through the 2008 financial crisis. That was the payback for what the mistakes that Greenspan made, except it wasn't payback enough because Ben Bernanke and now Janet Yellen came in to delay the full day of reckoning. We still haven't really dealt with all the consequences because we've postponed them with more quantitative easing, more 0% interest rates. But I think the economic crisis that we're heading for, the currency crisis, is going to dwarf as far as the economic pain for average Americans and investors than anything that happened in 2000 or 2008. Wow. What do you expect the politicians to do when that happens? Blame capitalism. You know, blame uh, a lack of regulation. Blame the speculators. Who knows? They're going to point the finger everywhere but at themselves. But hopefully, because of talk shows like yours, 
uh, enough information will get out there that more people will know to blame the government, to blame the bankers and the politicians for these problems, because capitalism didn't cause them. Had we had capitalism, we wouldn't have the problems. It's government interference with capitalism. That is the cause of all these problems. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. It's time to stop submitting to this tyranny. It's time to realize that we're being enslaved. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny with a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. Well, drones aren't illegal and guns aren't illegal, but what do you think about drones firing handguns? That sounds a little bit scary to me, but take a look at this footage. Now, the Federal Aviation Authority, which regulates aircraft and drones, prohibit weapons from being installed on a civil aircraft. So you can see right there, the drone is firing this gun. It fires four times. Um, you know, this hasn't stopped people from playing around with this concept. Totally frightening thought um, if this is in the hands of a civilian. But what about weaponized drones being given to local law enforcement? We already know that that's going to be happening. Weaponized drones are terrorizing people right now in Pakistan, for example. We know that... Uh, in India, they're going to be using weaponized pepper spray drones for crowd control, and an African company is selling weaponized drones for corporate use. This is a crowd control drone, and it's already selling to companies that are looking to stave off striking workers. It's a riot control drone armed with multiple guns that fire pepper spray bullets, paintballs, and blinding lasers. And some even come equipped with surveillance capabilities. So you thought your boss was a bad man. So these aren't the only frightening technological advances that we're going to have to be dealing with in the future. Yet another AI pioneer is coming out again, warning that smart computers could doom mankind. This is Professor Stuart Russell. He's a computer scientist who's led research on AI, and he fears humanity might be driving off a cliff with the rapid development of AI. He fears the technology could too easily be exploited for use by the military in weapons, putting them under the control of these AI systems. So specifically, he's pointing toward the rapid development of AI capabilities by companies such as Boston Dynamics, which was recently acquired by Google. And they've obviously been de developing all these autonomous robots for use by the military, you know, big dog and things like that that are absolutely frightening. Um, I, I recently interviewed Stuart Russell and Max Tegmark at an AI conference here in Austin. And, you know, they're staying true to this message and they're sharing their concerns with AI. And does the AI community concern itself at all with the future of human employment? For instance, I heard uh, Dr. Russell kind of joke about, well, we'll just let the policymakers figure it out. So um, he's got a lot of faith, but this is something that's going to happen probably by 2045. A lot of the, you know, Way sooner than that. it's a difficult problem. And I, I was at a meeting where there were five Nobel Prize winning economists um, and all they wanted to talk about was this question. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the future of employment and the structure of the economy when most uh, of what we call work now is being done by robots? Um, 
And unfortunately, even though that was what they really cared about, they had no suggestions. You know, you go to Japan and there's no one taking your order. You go to a vending machine and you order it. And obviously the Japanese economy has dealt with that. Sapiens Plurum means the wisdom of many. And it is an organization designed to look out for the interests of humankind as technology develops. Because I agree with you that uh, technology is a very powerful force that humans have created but will c humans continue to control it? The unfortunate thing is that we kind of get used to hell. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, there are lots of things about our current world that, that someone 500 years ago would think of as a vision of hell, but we're kind of used to them. And uh, fighting to keep our, you know. I must work in a cubicle 12 hours a day. How dare you make my life easier with AI? Most researchers, most of my friends in the AI field used to think that, well, you know, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime, so waste of time to think about it now but we're seeing in 2015 now a lot of things are happening that people thought were going to take much longer and a lot of people are saying well you know maybe these things are going to happen actually in our careers so it's now would be a great time to really start uh, looking into them could a weapons system blow up the world yeah it could do it because a computer decides that's the right thing to do but as far as I can tell, we are way more likely to have that happen when someone sits on something, yeah. like the red button. Personally speaking, I think that, that the risk that we have from AI is not really of AI becoming autonomous and taking over the world. There's a much bigger risk that a person will use AI for bad purposes. Privacy is a big thing, and thinking about what goals you give a program and what are the consequences of the goals, trying to get students to think into the future and to think more broadly than their individual program or robot, but what effect will that have on the people around, on the broader society. If that objective is not perfectly aligned with, with the values of, of us humans, um, then that creates the possibility for bad things to happen, for uh, that in some sense is the definition of conflict um, and getting into a conflict with systems that are more and more capable than we are doesn't sound like a good idea and uh, you know with any technology when we entered fire we realized after a while it was also a good idea to invent the fire department and fire alarms and fire extinguishers the more powerful the technology is the more urgent it is to actually also far ahead start thinking about how to get the best out of it. If you have autonomous weapons, you're going to have an arms race of autonomous weapons because uh, once you have autonomous attack weapons, then you need autonomous defense weapons because you know human reaction times are going to be too slow. Once you build little drones with a lot of AI ca capability, um, it's, not, it's very easy to make them. You just need a computer and some stuff you can buy on eBay and, and so on. And it'll be very difficult to keep them only in the right hands. You know, for example, clouds of miniaturized flying, flying robots against which it's impossible to defend. And, and you could imagine getting to a situation where you know, the life expectancy of a, a human soldier would be 10 seconds on the battlefield. And, and the life expectancy of a civilian if a government used those weapons against its own population would be you know, two seconds. And the key question is, will there be other new conflicts when these drones form in, fall into the hands of ISIS and Boko Haram and so on? You know, the Kalashnikov is a good example of a piece of technology that everybody has now, right? Even the guys in Paris who did this horrible uh, massacre against Charlie Hebdo. If, the, if weaponized drones become the new Kalashnikovs and everybody has them, I think that's really a net loss for humanity. I think we're going to see way more violence. So we have to be very careful, I think, to distinguish between fears about autonomous AI suddenly rising up, overcoming its programming, which is an unlikely scenario, and people deciding to use AI for purposes that um, are either unethical or um, basically do not value human life in the way that we should. And you could wipe out every inhabitant of a city uh, in a few minutes for a few million dollars. Mm -hmm. it, this is just not a direction that I think we should go. So I don't think robots are going to decide to destroy the world. I just want to make sure that my students don't program them to Wait. destroy the world <laughs> by accident. I thought they said these self-driving cars were going to be the bee's knees. 
but yet another self-driving Google car has been involved in an accident, another rear-end collision. Uh, Google says in all of those 14 crash instances, other motorists have been at fault. Ah, that's the answer, banned driving. That was a clip that we showed you a few months ago about a self-driving car, and for reasons I don't quite understand, this man has so much trust in this vehicle as it would stop and not run into him as we saw in the clip. And now we actually have a Google car involved in his first accident involving injury. Now to be fair, it wasn't the Google car's fault, it was involved in a rear end collision, somebody hit it. But the point I'm making is if you get into these self-driving cars or you have this super reliance on technology, you know, you take out your own personal responsibility. You know, like they train you in driver's ed, you need to be vigilant at all times. And the point I'm making is, it had a driver been vigilant and ready to react, they may have been able to swerve off and avoid some type of injury. So just something to keep in mind as we move toward the future, and hopefully we won't end up in some type of Wally -E scenario. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. <laughs> The situation in Greece, of course, is a tragedy, but it is also an absurdity. Nothing illustrates that better than this recent bridge loan agreement that we learned of this week, where the European Central Bank is going to give 7 billion euros to the Greek people so they can repay their loan to the European Central Bank. Let me repeat that. The Central Bank will loan them money to repay the Central Bank. Pretty ridiculous, right? Let's illustrate that on a microeconomic scale. Let's say that someone owes me some money. They don't have the money to repay me with. So what I do is I loan them some money so they can repay. Ah, not so quick. I'll take that back. You owe me that money. And oh, by the way, I repossessed your car. That's essentially what's happened in Greece. They've taken Greek assets. Even though they're playing this extended pretend game, even though they're passing around silly pieces of paper saying, I'm going to loan you money so you can loan me back money, they're taking hard assets, 50 billion euros worth of Greek assets. That's a huge bite out of real assets, economics, socialism. The bankers have encouraged people to create massive welfare states, to become consumers of their credit. Now, Margaret Thatcher said the problem with socialism is you eventually run out of other people's money. I would say the problem with socialism is that eventually the banks will run you out of your home. We've seen this happen in Venezuela. There we've seen the bankers bragging about how Hugo Chavez and his successors have given them a 700% return on their investment, paying the banks before they even allow the people to have access to food, water, and medicine. That's the way it is working in Greece as well. This is nothing new. The founders of this country knew this game very well. 200 plus years ago, Thomas Jefferson said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, then first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all of their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. So what is the solution? Jefferson had that as well. The rest of the quote says, the issuing power must be taken from the banks and restored to the people. People are beginning to wake up to the problem both here and in Greece. That's why Janet Yellen, chair of the private Federal Reserve, warned Congress not to interfere with them, to mind their own business. No, Congress needs to mind the people's business and it needs to take it back from these private central banks. For InfoWars, I'm David Knight. You traitors claiming I'm a Ruski agent, say it to my face and I'll break your nose. I'm sick of it. I will stomp your head in the ground, you traitorous maggots. While we go under Obamacare, North American Union, conquered by European banks, announcing our kids don't belong to us, total bondage, total surveillance, and you want to shoot your mouth off about me being a Ruski agent, I will stomp your head in the ground. Never water yourself down just because someone can't handle you at 100 proof. It's the Alex Jones Show because there's a war on for your mind. Oh, I, will, oh, I wish we go back to the days. I'm telling you of just getting my satisfaction out in the street.
You pick a sword or something else, you're going out the street. I'm not kidding, you cowardly sh- Media spin fail artist Susan Rice has done it again. You may recall how Rice declared on five mainstream media interview shows that the Benghazi attack was a result of rioting due to the horribly produced and nefarious film Innocence of the Muslims. What happened this week in Cairo, uh, in, in Benghazi, and, and many other parts of the region, a direct result of a heinous and offensive video uh, that was widely disseminated that the U.S. government had nothing to do with. Or how about this doozy from the United States National Security Advisor? Sergeant Bergwell, there are a lot of questions about how he originally was captured and whether or not he had deserted, had left uh, his post. Is that going to be investigated? And if it's found that he did indeed uh, leave his post, will he be disciplined or has already paid the price? He served the United States with honor and distinction. Ms. Rice has stepped in it again. The sanctions will be suspended and Iran will begin to be able to access its frozen accounts around the world. What do we think they'll spend that money on? We think for the most part, they're going to need to spend it on the Iranian people and their economy, which is tanked. And in fact, we should expect that some portion of that money would go to the Iranian military and could potentially be used for the kinds of bad behavior uh, that we have seen in the region uh, up until now. This admission opens up the floodgates to scathing criticism of the highly unpopular deal the Obama administration, NATO dubbed a historic breakthrough, made with Iran. Over a hundred billion dollars worth of frozen Iranian assets are to be thawed due to the deal that has Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu deeming it a historic mistake. While the negotiators were closing the deal in Vienna, Iran's supposedly moderate president chose to go to a rally in Tehran. And at this rally, a frenzied mob burned American and Israeli flags and chanted, death to America, death to Israel. Now, this didn't happen four years ago. It happened four days ago. An official spokesman cited by the Saudi Arabian press agency also said, Iran should, with the conclusion of this accord, put her resources towards its development and amelioration of the condition of the Iranian people instead of provoking troubles which would generate certain reactions from countries in the region. But of course, the reckless hubris of the Obama administration would have us ignore this. <laughs> Ron Dermer, Israel's ambassador to the United States, outlined four major problems with the Iran deal. First, Iran now has a vast nuclear infrastructure and a history of deceiving IAEA inspectors for years. This is not the hoped for dismantle for dismantle deal in which the sanctions regime would be dismantled in exchange for the dismantling of Iran's nuclear weapons making capability. Second, the temporary restrictions placed on Iran expire in 10 years. Iran could be a hulking beast of terrorist activity by then. Third, the nuclear arms race will be galvanized in the most dangerous region on earth. And finally, the deal transfers to the Iranian regime's coffers $150 billion that is now frozen in foreign bank accounts. Iran has a $300 billion to $400 billion economy. A $150 billion cash bonanza for the regime is the equivalent of $8 trillion flowing into the U.S. Treasury. Tens of billions are likely to flow to the Shiite militias in Iraq, the Assad regime in Syria, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and other Iranian terror proxies in the region. Billions more will go to strengthening Iran's global terror network, which it has used to perpetrate terror attacks on five Five continents in more than 30 cities, from Buenos Aires to Burgas, Bulgaria to Bangkok. I continue to be much more concerned when it comes to our security with the prospect of uh, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan, which is part of the reason why uh, the United States, showing its continued international leadership, uh, has organized uh, a forum over the last several years that's been able to help eliminate uh, that threat in a consistent way. Folks, we are in big trouble. John Bound for Infowars.com.
As humanity moves toward its future, the focus of technology has intensified on engineering a more perfect human being. A human being with a better immune system, more enhanced health function, even an infinitely smarter human being. But something that has beguiled humanity for millennia, the fountain of youth. Yes, they are still searching for that. So would you be interested in science that could help you look and feel 30 years younger? I know I would. Well, hang in there because my guest today is working on some really innovative t science and technology. He says it's going to be a great thing for humanity. Uh, if you can get the funding, <laughs> this is Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a Cambridge University researcher. He heads the strategies for engineered negligible senescence project. Senescence is scientific jargon for aging. So their research is really focusing on fighting disease, but along the way they have defined seven causes of aging, and these are things that he thinks can be dealt with. Dr. DeGray, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So talk to us a little bit about your SENS product. You're engineering healthier humans, and I guess a byproduct of that could be life extension? Absolutely. My product is exactly the right word to use. We are just a biomedical research institute. We do the same kind of research that anyone else does who is trying to develop new medicine. We get a lot of people thinking that we are trying to work on longevity for the sake of longevity, irrespective of health. And that could not be further from the truth. So I'm delighted that you understand that what we do is simply medical research. But of course, our medical research is focused on the diseases and disabilities of old age. And we believe that we can indefinitely prevent those diseases with medicines that we think could be developed within the next couple of decades. So that means that people would stay truly youthful, both mentally and physically, as long as they live. Now, of course, that would have quite a big byproduct in terms of longevity, probably anyway, simply because the main thing people die of these days is being sick. And indeed, in the industrialized world anyway, the main thing that gets people to be sick is simply having been born a long time ago. And so you have targeted some of these things that really cause the most uh, aging in humans. Is there anything that you would suggest, you know, for those of us who are like really holding out for the next 25 years, hoping to be the lucky recipient of some anti-aging technology. What can we do to really, what would you say is the most valuable thing that we could do? Uh, you're not going to like my answer to this question. <laughs> uh, the problem is that at the moment, unless you do something really dumb, like, you know, smoking a lot or getting seriously overweight, you know, the kind of things that we all know we shouldn't be doing, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, some people, of course, are just unlucky genetically or whatever. They um, they have some aspects of aging that are occurring unusually rapidly in their bodies. And for those people, there may be some things that can be done in terms of supplements and so on. But for most people, there really isn't. We can see this by looking across the world, what people do do. You know, if we look at, um, for example, the difference between America and Japan, um, you know, people laugh at America a lot because it's so far down the league table of longevity, like in the 40s or something like that, um, even though you spend, um, you know, far more than any other country per head on, on medical, medical care. Uh, but the thing is that actually it's not so laughable because it's not such a big difference. Mm. The difference in longevity between Japan and America is only four years. So, you know, that really tells you how little can be done, even if one has exactly the right genetics and the right diet and the right lifestyle and the right social structures and everything, you know, still you don't get very much. So that's telling you what the answer to your question is not. So the question is, what is the answer? And the only answer really is, give me and Sense Research Foundation large amounts of money <laughs> so that we can do this research a great deal faster. I honestly believe at this point that that is the only impediment that is slowing us down a lot. We've got the right plan. We've got the right scientists. What we don't have is the money. At the moment, it's pitiful. Our budget is only $5 million a year. If we added one zero to that, if we made it up to 50 million, then we could probably go three times faster. 
And that would save the most astronomical number of lives in the future. And what do you think about the laser technology that's out there? There's a lot of uh, new things on the market. I mean, maybe they've been around for a decade or so, but they're relatively new. You know, laser treatments seem to be giving the fountain of youth there. Mm. Well, um, of course, we know that there's been steady progress in cosmetic treatments in general, whether it's skin creams, whether it's laser surgery, whether it's, um, you know, Botox, whatever. These things have all progressed and will continue to progress. But the thing is that there's only so much you can do to preserve youth of how people look on the outside um, without actually having a pretty comprehensive ability to preserve youth on the inside. Right. If people are still accumulating damage internally, then they're going to go downhill. And that's why people with plastic surgery and so on do not look very good. Right. So, uh, we, so um, conversely, once we can fix everything that's on the inside, um, you know, the outside is the easy part. Well, what do you think about um, someone else who's really sort of seeking the answer to... Um, longevity and everything, Ray Kurzweil, he is uh, basically saying the only way we're going to be able to achieve immortality is merging with machine or uploading our brains to the computer. I like your research because you're actually kind of going in to the human body, which I think is already this perfect machine, and you're, you're sort of fixing us. I think you are somewhat oversimplifying Ray Kurzweil's position on this. What he has said is that we need to have a progression of technologies that will um, postpone the ill health of old age um, you know, in a kind of bootstrapping stepping way. Um, he and I are somewhat apart in terms of the early stage of this, about what people can do today. He would be a good deal more optimistic than I am with regard to the average person's ability to postpone the ill health of old age using supplements and vitamins and such like that we have today. But if we look into the more distant future, Ray and I are very aligned. His, what he often called bridge two, the technologies that will come along in the foreseeable future, the next 20 years or so maybe, um, that will do a lot better than anything we can do today, those technologies are pretty much identically sound. They are pretty much exactly the regenerative medicine for aging that Sense Research Foundation pursues. And if we go to the final stage, here's bridge three, which is really the one you just mentioned about um, merging of man and machine and so on. Really, again, he and I are pretty aligned because really what he's saying there is that as time goes on uh, and as we achieve greater and greater miniaturization, especially of various devices, we will have a greater and greater ability to apply, let's call it just simply non-biological solutions to various medical problems, including the problems of aging. And those non-biological solutions will eventually take over, really. They will become dominant as what we do medically. And that may even end up with uh, essentially um, rebuilding our brains in one way or another so that they are more resilient. So, yeah, there's, um, there's, there's not really nearly so much difference between what Ray thinks and what I think as it seems at first sight. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that I personally would be, you know, interesting or something enough to where they would want to preserve my brain forever. But someone like, you know, Ray Kurzweil or, you know, Steve Jobs or someone like that, uh, Nikola Tesla, it's, it's kind of sad when those people, if they pass away and all of that all of that knowledge goes with them. So there, that's my one thing I can kind of understand. Uh, I, I, I object to your suggestion that you're not interesting enough. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is for everybody, this technology. This is very important to understand. All lives matter. All lives should be of high quality as well as high quantity. And there's no real, there's no reason whatsoever to stipulate that only smart people or only <laughs> creative people should, 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 should benefit from all of this. Um, Remember, this is not about, about preserving brains just only. It's preserving life in general. And that's something that most people believe in for everybody. Thank you for tuning into the show tonight.